Professor Friedman's uh, subject today is the energy crisis, a humane solution. I want to start this talk on energy by reading to you a quotation of something that was written some time ago by an eminent expert on energy. And here it goes. Day by day, it becomes more evident that the oil we happily possess in excellent quali quality and abundance is the mainspring of modern material civilization. Oil, in truth, stands not beside but entirely above all other commodities. It is a material source of the energy of the country, the universal aid, the factor in everything we do. It can be no matter of surprise that year by year, we make larger drafts upon a material of such myriad qualities, of such miraculous powers. The question concerning the duration of our present cheap supplies of oil cannot but excite deep interest and anxiety wherever or whenever it is mentioned for a little reflection will show that oil is almost the sole necessary basis of our material power. The constant tendency of discovery is to render oil a more and more efficient agent, while there is no probability that when our oil is used up, any more powerful substitute will be forthcoming. We cannot make up for a future want of oil by importation from other countries. Considering how greatly our manufacturers and navigation depend upon oil, and how vast is our consumption of it compared with that of other nations, it cannot be supposed that we shall do without oil more than a fraction of what we do with it. It is then simply inferred that we cannot long continue our present rate of progress. All things considered, it is not reasonable to suppose or expect that the power of oil will ever be superseded by anything better. It is a naturally best source of power as air, and water and gold and iron are, each for its own purposes, the most useful of substances, and such as will never be superseded. I draw the conclusion that we cannot long maintain our present rate of increase of consumption, that the cost of fuel must rise to a rate injurious to our commercial and manufacturing supremacy. And the conclusion is inevitable that our present happy progressive condition is a thing of limited duration. The alternatives before us are simple. We have to take the momentous choice between brief but true greatness and longer continued mediocrity. Now, if I were to ask you questions about who wrote that and when, I suspect most of you would say, well, that must have been written about five or six years ago by a very, very prescient man, a man who really saw the future very well. Well, the truth to tell, those words, with one exception where I have taken liberty with it that I'll come back to, were written in a book first published in 1865. The one exception is that everywhere I read the word oil, the original had the word coal. And it dealt with Great Britain and not with the United States. The excerpts I have read to you are from a book called The Coal Question, written by a great English economist, W. Stanley Jevons, and published in 1865. And he, at that time, in writing about the coal question, said exactly the same thing, as you can see, that our supposed experts have been saying about the oil question in these recent years. He was wrong, as you realize. And indeed, I may say, uh, he uh, was even more farsighted. He went farther. In the course of his investigation of this, he considered all possibilities including the possibility that you might use uh, uh, airplanes instead of as a way of, of, of economizing on coal. And he wrote, uncertainty will forever render aerial conveyance a commercial impossibility. Even if an aerial machine could be propelled by some internal power from 50 to 100 miles an hour, it could not make head against a gale. <laughs> he went on, he, uh, this was 1865. But as you may know, oil and petroleum had been discovered, and he wrote, petroleum has of late years become the matter of a most expensive, extensive trade and has been found admirably adapted for use in marine steam engine boilers. 
Its natural supply is far more limited and uncertain than that of coal. And an artificial supply can only be had by the distillation of some kind of coal at considerable cost. To extend the use of petroleum, then, is only a new way of pushing the consumption of coal. It is more likely to be an aggravation of the drain than a remedy. Well, that's come full circle. We are now talking about how coal will save us from the shortage of oil. And he was talking about how oil could not save you from the shortage of coal. Now, as I say, what conclusion do we draw from that? Jevons was a very eminent and able man. He was no charlatan. He was one of the great economists of the 19th century. But he was dead wrong. Should we draw the problem that therefore, uh, the conclusion that therefore no problem will arise? Not at all. After all, at least one of his predictions was correct. You will remember he said we have to make the momentous choice between brief but true greatness and longer continued mediocrity. And after all, Great Britain has now descended to long continued mediocrity. Not for the reasons that Jevons supposed, but for very different reasons. I don't believe we should draw the conclusion that no problem should, will arise. Or should we draw the conclusion that two people, two economists from RAND, Fred Huffman and Richard Nerung, recently stated in an article in a publication produced by uh, that admirable Institute of Contemporary Studies that Laurie Chickering is associated with. They said, and I quote, design of prudent energy policy under such uncertainty requires analysis of the implications of alternative resource estimates. These results should be tested in more detailed calculations than those presented and for sensitivity to key assumptions. That is, they are saying that the, given such uncertainty, what we've got to have to do is to try to pin it down and make sure how much future resources we have. That's not the right conclusion either. On the contrary, all that is is a proposal for a make-work project for unemployed economists and engineers. It's doubtful of any amount of research of the kind that Huffman and Nehrung proposed would have enabled William Stanley Jevons to foresee the discovery of North Sea oil. The fact is that we cannot get out of the problem by being able to predict things that are not predictable. That the right conclusion is that the crystal ball is inevitably cloudy. That that is the nature of the world we live in. That all specific predictions about the precise amount of this, that, or the other deserve skepticism. That what we need is not the kind of specific, detailed blueprint for the future that Huffman and Nehring would like to produce, that what we need is an adjustment mechanism that will enable us to adapt to what happens as it develops. And of course, as everybody in this room knows, there is such a system, namely the price mechanism, which successfully steered us over several centuries from wood to coal to whale oil to petroleum to natural gas. That is a mechanism in which you, it is in the self-interest of hundreds and thousands and millions of people to make their best guesses about the future, in which it's unnecessary to have a single blueprint, in which you have an automatic adjustable mechanism as things develop. If we have a problem today in the energy area, as we do, it is solely, in my opinion, because that system has not been allowed to work. The price mechanism has not been allowed to work by the U.S. at home. It is not, has not been allowed to work by the OPEC cartel abroad, which has created a monopoly to, uh, raise, and has raised drastically the price and reduced the availability of oil. The problem in energy and in the approach to energy is part of a much broader problem and a problem which we will be faced with and have been faced with in a variety of other areas and not merely in the energy area. It is what you might call the difference between the economic way of thinking and the engineering way of thinking. 
the broader problem is very much epitomized by the famous Club of Rome report, Limits of Growth, which got so much attention a few years ago. You will all recall that that was a report in which engineers were saying, we have finite resources, a finite amount of coal, a finite amount of space, and so on and so on. Things grow at exponential rates, and so long as things grow at exponential rate, they're ultimately going to become infinite. And since resources are finite, we're going to bump into it, and therefore we are faced with a terrible future in which sooner or later we're going to run out of steel or coal or whatever you want to name we're going to run out of. <clears throat> and we really have to adjust our sights. We can no longer take the view that we can have growth forever. We must recognize that there are, in their title, limits to growth, and reconcile ourselves. It's the same approach that was developed by the late Mr. Schumacher in his emphasis on the idea that small is beautiful. It's the kind of an approach that underlies the appeal of zero growth, of the notion that resources are finite. For example, in the energy case, literally echoing Jevons, you could almost have taken it out of Jevons, a recent report of the Committee for Economic Development, an organization of American businessmen, says, and I quote, the era of abundant cheap energy is over. The people of the U.S. must face the fact that there will be significant changes in the mix of energy that they use and that energy is going to cost more. Now this approach, whether adopted by the Club of Rome or by Mr. Schumacher or by the CAD, is completely wrong. The plain fact is that from an economic point of view, the volume of resources available to us is larger today than it has ever been in history. We are less dependent today on natural resources than we have ever been. Tell me, do we have more energy resources available today than Jevons thought we had at the time he wrote? Of course we do. If you go back 20 years before Jevons, before the oil was discovered in any significant amount, the volume of energy available was much less because as long as we didn't know about that oil, it wasn't a resource available. <clears throat> in, the, in this country, in the 1920s, there was a great uproar about the fact that the total volume of reserves of petroleum available would only last 10 or 20 years. Today, the total volume of reserves, of known reserves, is higher than it has ever been not only in absolute barrels, but relative to an, a, a year's consumption, relative to the population. How can that, what's true in the case of oil is true in the case of all of these other natural resources. Invention, discovery, innovation has made, has enabled us to discover substitutes for natural resources. It has enabled us to learn how to use them more effectively, to recycle them. If you look at it from a different point of view, suppose you ask yourself what fraction of the total income of the nation comes from basic natural resources. Well, if you were going back 200 years ago, that would have been a very, very large fraction because agriculture would have been the dominant industry. It would have been the productivity of the land that would have been the major element. Today, the total contribution of natural resources to our national income is probably the order of 10 percent. The great improvement has been in the, in the use of services, in the development of ways of getting along without natural resources, or of discovering more natural resources. And that process is inevitably going to continue. If we look at it and stick to it in the field of oil, much more important from my point of view than the evidence from these calculated figures on reserves is the evidence from prices. The calculated figures on reserves I have no confidence in. They have been revised over and over again. 
and who knows where they will be next time they're revised. Uh, I have no doubt that they serve some function, otherwise I can't see why the oil companies would pay geologists to make the estimates, but they are, as history has shown, extremely unreliable. But the prices are much more interesting because they really tell you something about what has been happening to the availability of energy. And the basic fact here is that the real cost of energy, adjusting for inflation, the amount you have to pay for a unit of energy expressed in terms of other goods or expressed in terms of the number of minutes you have to work to pay for it, has been going down for at least 100 years. The real cost of energy relative to prices in general went down by 28% from 1950 to 1970. It may surprise you to know that a gallon of gas that you buy at the service station today, including taxes, costs less in real terms relative to other goods and services today than it did 20 years ago. What happened is that in the interim, it went down sharply. And in the last three years, it's come back up sharply. But it is still below the level at which it was 20 years ago. I must say, one of the things that amazes me is really fundamentally the low cost of this gasoline. Uh, one of my favorite exam questions uh, used to be, and if I were, fortunately, I've gone out of the business of giving exams, but if I were giving them, I'd still use it. It used to be the following. I used to say, a gallon of gasoline, uh, let me use current figures, a gallon of gasoline at the service station pumped into your car costs you, some, including taxes, costs you something like 65 to 70 cents here. If you go to the supermarket, a gallon of bottled water costs 79 cents. How do you explain the difference in those prices? Isn't that really quite an incredible little phenomenon? Here's water, supposedly the prime example of a free good. 79 cents for a bottle of bottled water, gallon of it. Whereas you have to put a well into the ground, extract the oil, send it through a refinery, put the refined product through a pipeline, take it to a gasoline station, have a man stand there and pump the thing, and you get it for less than that per gallon. Now the question is, why is it relevant to the problem of the scarcity or the possible scarcity of energy to the energy crisis? Why is it relevant that the costs have been going down, that the real cost has been going down? And this goes back to the way in which the market operates with respect to exhaustible resources. This is a very interesting and old subject in which I may say that the uh, import, most important contribution was made by a mathematical economist and statistician now dead, Harold Hotelling, in a famous article back in the middle of the 1930s on the economics of exhaustible resources. And he said, suppose you have a resource that's exhaustible. I've got a mine, and there's only a certain amount of stuff in it, and I own it and I'm selling it. What can I say about the intelligent way for me to exploit it? How should I handle it? How should I run it as a businessman? In particular, should I, sell, should I produce and sell now, or should I hold it in the ground to sell later on? Well, you can see immediately when you look at it that way what makes sense. If you mine it right now, you get cash in the hand. You can put that in a savings bank or buy a bond and get interest on it. So it will not pay you to keep it in the ground unless later on when you mine it or sell it, you can get a price high enough to cover the interest that you could have earned in the meantime. If you think the price five years from now is going to be a dollar, let's say, and now it's a dollar, it'll pay you to mine it now and not keep it in the ground. It will only pay you to keep it in the ground if you think the price is now, let's say, a dollar, and five years from now it will be a dollar and fifty cents. Well, consequently, if you have an exhaustible resource, 
Unless people expect the future price to be higher than the present price, they have an incentive to bring it out now. That tends to drive down the present price. It tends to drive up the future price. And therefore, economically, you have a very simple test of whether anything is an exhaustible resource. Namely, is its price rising over time? But if we look at the price of energy and of oil, its real cost price has been going down over time. Now, how can that be? There are only two possible explanations. Either the oil companies who have been selling this are extremely stupid and short-sighted and have been throwing away billions of dollars out of their ignorance or incompetence, which seems to me a rather extreme assumption. At any rate, I would have thought that if that were the case, it would have been possible to make a great deal of money by buying a few of them up and setting them on a sensible course. The only other explanation is that from an economic point of view, oil is not an exhaustible resource. You see, consider the difference between a limited finite resource of which you're never going to have any more and something of which you can produce currently. Consider wheat. You can keep on producing constant crops of wheat. Or you can keep on manufacturing uh, automobiles or producing services. And where you have a reproducible product, there is no reason why its real price <clears throat> relative to other things should rise over time. <clears throat> if you have a Rembrandt that's never going to be produced again, well, then its real price has to rise over time. There's an honest-to-God exhaustible finite resource. But of course, if I have the ordinary garden variety painters who can paint pictures by the hundreds, there's no reason for those prices to be rising over time. And so the alternative interpretation, and the only one that makes sense, is that in any economic sense, oil, far from being an exhaustible resource, is a producible resource. At constant, more or less constant, or indeed declining costs, because of the improvements in the technology of drilling and exploring and so on, you can find more oil. And therefore, the future price could not rise above the present because if it tended to do so, it would give somebody an incentive to go out and find more and add to the supply. Of course, that situation may change. But tell me, is it sensible to talk the way so many people talk about the oil industry? The way I interpret them is they say the whole history of oil is divided into two periods. From 1859, when oil was first discovered in Titusville, Pennsylvania, to 1973, and from 1973 to 1978. Well, conceivably, that could be true. But it seems to show a very short-sighted point of view and a lack of perspective to divide all of a, a 120 years of history into two parts, one 115 years long and one five years long, and say, we know that there's been a fundamental change. Maybe, but if we allowed the market to work, if there were such a fundamental change, that would show up in the form of a change in the price pattern and a change in the incentives to people to find, exploit, and use oil. If you look back over the past history, the talk about the fact that this has been a nation that has been wasting energy, that we have been uh, squandering a finite resource, is utter nonsense. By any relevant criterion, the situation is precisely the opposite. At least since the 1920s, governmental policy has been making energy more expensive than it should have been. Relative to the real costs of producing energy, it, we have been overpaying for it. If, if, from an economic point of view, we have been doing anything, we've been using too little energy and not too much. The artificial pricing of energy has forced us to substitute more expensive ways of producing things for energy. Well, then you will say to me, why then is it that we have an energy crisis? Why does President Carter propose a major far-reaching program that would restructure the whole energy industry? 
Why does he say that this is a first priority item? That fighting the energy fight is a moral equivalent of war? The answer, I believe, is that three forces have coalesced to produce a real energy problem. The first and the most immediate was the establishment of an effective OPEC cartel, of an effective monopoly, which, beginning in 1973, was able to raise substantially the price of oil. Incidentally, the creation and establishment of that monopoly owes a great deal to the encouragement which was given to the OPEC countries to form such an organization by the mistaken diplomacy of the United States government. The second factor has been the cumulative effect over time of government controls and regulation, beginning to go to the most important of them with the fixing of the price of natural gas from the 50s and of oil from 1971. And the third has been a change in the philosophical attitudes of the public toward the role of government in a, these affairs. And I want to discuss each of these three things in turn. The cartel, the cumulative effect of regulations, and the change in philosophical attitudes. So far as the cartel is concerned, there has been a great deal of misunderstanding about its behavior. We read in the paper that the cartel was formed for political reasons in order to exploit uh, uh, the uh, Middle East situation. We read the paper discussions tend to be in terms of the political attitudes or the moral values or the beliefs of the country. Saudi Arabia is, is resisting raising prices because she's a friend of ours. And maybe uh, uh, Libya or Iraq is trying to raise prices because they're not friends of ours. In my opinion, that is all uh, uh, extremely superficial. There's a very simple interpretation of what's happening to the cart in oil and in the cartel. A group of nations got together and formed a monopoly. Now, again, just as with the theory of exhaustible resources, there's a well-developed theory of how a cartel should behave. Let's suppose you were able to form a cartel. What should you do? What's your practice? What's your policy? Well, in the first place, you can only form a cartel Effectively, insofar as somehow you can restrict supplies. Unless you can keep down the amount available, there's no way in which you can raise the price. If you fix a high price, you have to be prepared to limit the amount sold to the amount people want to buy at that price. The feasibility of having a cartel in oil arises out of the existence of two countries in particular, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait that have large flexibility in the amount of oil that they are willing and able to produce and therefore are able to serve the function of restricting output or expanding it to the necessities of the market. In the second place, if you form a cartel, if you look at it from the point of view of Saudi Arabia as a manager of the cartel, you know very well that it's much harder for people to adjust right away than it is if you give them time. In the short run, in 1973, when the price of oil was quadrupled, people are set in their ways and their patterns. They have certain methods of operation. Overnight, the quantity demanded is not going to be much affected. Similarly, the higher price will give other people an incentive to produce substitutes. But it takes time. If you're going to produce other oil wells, you have to drill oil wells, you have to explore them, you have to develop them, similarly with other substitutes. Therefore, the thing that is most obvious to you is that your monopoly power is very much greater at the time you form the cartel than it will be later on. And therefore, the sensible thing to do for you to do, the way to exploit a cartel, is first to push up the price very high, and then, over time, as people try, start to restrict their consumption and other sources of supply come in, you gradually let the price come down so as to take advantage of your less favorable position until ultimately the price is 
not only back to where it was to begin with, but it's lower than it was to begin with. Because when you finally come to the end of this process, you have additional sources of supply that you wouldn't have had if you hadn't encouraged them during the cartel. That's indeed not only the logically rational way to run a cartel, it's the way almost all cartels have been run. Whether you take the Stevenson rubber restriction scheme back in the 1920s, which was very comparable, in which rubber producing nations got together for what was then regarded as an essential item, and they quadrupled the price of rubber. And within something like five or six years, the price of natural rubber was lower than it had been to start with. Or if you take the domestic example of the United States Steel Corporation and the Gary Agreement at the turn of the century, when U.S. Steel played the same role in the steel industry that Saudi Arabia is playing in the, uh, in the oil industry of being the, uh, the final adjuster or leader of the cartel holding an umbrella over the other members of the cartel. Now, that is a w what's been happening. The real price of oil today is decidedly lower than it was in 1973 when the cartel was first formed because inflation, price rises elsewhere have been greater than any rise in the dollar price of oil. Moreover, once you look at it that way, you will see immediately why you have the different countries in the cartel taking the positions they do. If Saudi Arabia is the one that's holding the umbrella over the others, if it's going to let everybody else in the cartel produce more or less what they would like and want to produce, while it itself is going to adjust, then it's clear that the other countries want high prices. And Saudi Arabia is the only one that has a strong interest in not letting the price get too high. Here is Iran or Iraq. If you hold the price high, and if they are allowed to sell all they want to produce, the result of that will simply be that Saudi Arabia, from their point of view, will have to cut, out its, cut down its output sharply. So it's perfectly understandable from a purely logical, rational analysis of the position of the participants that Saudi Arabia has wanted, has been the most moderate in trying to hold down relatively the price of oil, while Iran, Iraq, and the others have been the most, uh, 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 the most aggressive. It has nothing to do with anything else. And if Iran, if the Shah of Iran was assuring President Carter that Iran was not in favor of sharply raising the price of oil, that wasn't because he was a friend of America. It was because he and everybody else could see that the market conditions in oil was change, were changing. Because time enough has passed for a reduction in consumption and for an expansion in production. Now, the cartel has not been, the price has not been coming down as fast as I thought it would or as it would have if it weren't for the fact that we and the rest of the world have been helping the cartel. We and the rest of the world have been helping the cartel by doing everything we can to prevent people from, finding, from having an incentive to discover and produce more oil. It's not only the United States that's been guilty in this. Every country, whether it be Great Britain or other countries, have seen this as a great opportunity to make a killing, and so they have tried to impose heavy taxes or to offer uh, exploration on terms which would bring back to the government a large fraction of the gross receipts. And the result is that you have had less exploration and less intensive search for new sources than you would have. But the United States has been the worst sinner. It's fascinating to note that energy consumption has dropped in every major country in the world except the United States since 1973. And the reason it has not dropped in the United States is because we in the United States have been trying to prevent the price of energy from reflecting fully the higher OPEC cartel price. We, in fact, have been subsidizing the import of oil. As I'm sure all of you know, the effect of the entitlement program in oil is that we are paying a subsidy of roughly $3 a barrel on every barrel of oil imported from OPEC or from anybody else outside this country. Incredible policy, but a fact. But despite 
the best efforts of the United States and other countries to shore up the cartel, it'll break. It's a question of time, and you can see the signs already. The newspapers have been full of stories that there's going to be a glut of oil in the next few years. But they say, oh, of course, that's temporary. Wait till 1985. Well, wait till 1985. Let me turn to the second main factor, which has been the cumulative effect of government controls and regulations. And here, the oil industry must bear much of the blame. I, I would not want to, for a moment, suggest the idea that we have a wicked government on one side and a snow-pure, snow-white oil industry on the other. Very far from it. There is no industry in this country that speaks more loudly about the virtues of free enterprise and does more to undermine it than the oil industry. Until the 1970s, government controls and regulations were very strongly pro Texas, Oklahoma oil industry. Beginning in the 1920s, the oil industry induced the federal government to introduce a specially favorable treatment on taxes, the infamous percentage depletion arrangements. Beginning in the 1930s, you had pro-rationing of oil by state boards, the Texas Railroad Commission, the Oklahoma Commission, and so on. Essentially, a government state-administered cartel allocating production quotas to various outfits. And that was made possible by the federal legislation, the Connolly Hot Oil Act, which made it a federal offense to transport oil produced in excess of state quotas across state lines. Incidentally, that was not John Connolly. That was Tom Connolly, the, the flamboyant Texan who always used to wear a black tie. <clears throat> in 1959, President Eisenhower, so you can see I'm strictly bipartisan, introduced oil import quotas. That's an absolutely marvelous example of the perversity of government, of how government has an absolute genius for doing precisely the opposite of what needs to be done. <laughs> Here in 1959, the situation was that foreign oil was cheap and plentiful. Domestic oil was, relatively speaking, expensive and scarce. So what do we do? We keep out the cheap, plentiful oil, and we encourage domestic oil by imposing a quota on the amount of oil that could be imported from abroad. The result was to make the price of oil in the United States about a dollar and a half a barrel higher than the price of oil in the world market. Now comes 1973 and what happens? Foreign oil becomes scarce and expensive. Domestic oil becomes, relatively speaking, cheap and available. So what do we do in the full wisdom of the government? We impose a tax on the production of a domestic oil and give a subsidy to importing the expensive, scarce foreign oil. If you could think of more perverse policies, you have a better imagination than I do. Now, the situation has changed. Tom Connolly, Sam Rayburn, Lyndon Johnson, who gave Texas about 68 votes in the Senate and the House, have passed from the scene. Texas no longer has the enormous political clout it once had. And as a result, these measures, these governmental interventions which favored the domestic oil industry have passed from the scene. Percentage depletion has been eliminated. The oil import quotas have been eliminated. Pro-rationing continues but not nearly as effectively. And instead, you have had a new set of interventions in, uh, imposed which benefit and harm a different group of people. You had the two other sets of controls that entered in. The controls on the price of natural gas starting in the 1950s after the Phillips oil decision in which the federal energy uh, the Federal Power Commission has specified maximum prices at which ga natural gas may be sold between states. 
That was bad enough. As with any price control which holds a price below the market price, it encourages consumption and discourages production. And so the effect has been that consumers, residential consumers in particular, but also industry, were very much encouraged by artificially low prices to convert to gas. On the other hand, producers were discouraged from finding and producing and distributing gas. And it was inevitable that you were then going to have shortages and disruptions of supply. But this was greatly exacerbated by the imposition of general price and wage control in 1971 by Mr. Nixon, August 15, 1971, which included the control on the price of oil. We tend to forget that really the Pr price and wage control measures of 1971 bear a great deal of responsibility for our present oil problem. They have been eliminated on every other product, but not on oil. It was an unfortunate accident that just at the time when those price and wage controls were being dismantled, you had the oil crisis in the Middle East, you had the crisis in the Middle East, and you had 1973, the uh, uh, quadrupling of the price of oil by OPEC. There was an oil price control in place, but it was and it was not removed. If that had come six months later, when the oil price control had already been removed, along with everybody, everything else, it might not have been reimposed. But that's hypothetical. What is the fact is that it remained, and it has had the same effects in discouraging production encouraging consumption, increasing the fraction of our energy that comes from abroad, and establishing new vested interests in the maintenance of controls. The third factor that entered in, as I mentioned earlier, was a change in the philosophical attitudes. One thing is clear if we come back to our earlier distinction between economics and engineering. There is no economic argument for the regulation of oil. There is no argument on economic grounds for having a Department of Energy, for having a Federal Energy Administration, for having price controls. And there is almost no professional economist who will argue otherwise. As uh, Professor Edward Mitchell said in a piece he wrote, on the ideology of oil, and I quote, the last five chairmen of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, spanning the Johnson to Carter administrations, have supported the decontrol of both oil and gas. Now, those five chairmen run the gamut of professional opinion from what would be called left to right, yet every single one of them was in favor of the deregulation of oil and gas. If you take another example, there is no disagreement between Paul Samuelson and myself, who write, both of whom write columns for Newsweek and who supposedly represent different spectrums of professional opinion, on the desirability of eliminating regulation of oil and gas. The only difference of opinion is that, having stated it would be desirable to do so, Paul goes on to say, but it's not politically feasible, so let's look at what's the least bad alternative. And I have self-restraint enough not to engage in those statements. <laughs> also, the bulk of informed professional opinion believes that the energy industry is effectively competitive, or would be if the government got its cotton-picking hands out of it. So there's no economic argument along these lines. You have had a great deal of talk about obscene profits. There again, there is no argument. There have been a number of very careful studies made of profits of the oil industry. On the average, they are not out of line, indeed, of anything somewhat low, relative to invested capital by comparison with other industrial groups. So there is no economic argument on any level for the regulation of oil. <clears throat> Why then do we have it? Well, I think again, if I may quote Edward Mitchell, 
who said about Carter's energy program, and I quote, the preference of houses over cars, non-energy over energy, solar energy over oil, indeed almost any other source of energy over oil, is what leaps out at you when you read the National Energy Plan. You will not find these preferences explained in any economic book. The answer is to be found in political philosophy. An even more striking example of philosophy is the attitude that has been expressed towards so-called windfall profits. Let me quote to you a sentence from Mr. Carter's National Energy Plan, and I quote, the producers have no equitable claim to that enhanced value from deregulation because it is unrelated to their activities or economic contribution. Now to see how radical a doctrine that is, how fundamentally subversive of our system that doctrine is, let me translate it into another context. Let me apply the same principle. The owners of homes, or for that matter of shares of stock, or of anything else you can mention, but let me just stick to the owners of homes. The owners of homes have no equitable claim to any rise in their value because it is unrelated to their activities or economic contribution. Is there anybody who would say that that was an expression of what should be the philosophy guiding America? Who is going to decide what change in value is related to activities or economic considerations? If people are going to be entitled to keep a rise in value only insofar as it flows from their own activities and contributions, then somebody has to decide. This, that sentence in the National Energy Plan is a sentence declaring the alleged case for a government that owns everything. If it has the right over the supposed owners to the rise in the value of oil, it has the right to the rise in the value of houses. It has, a rise, uh, it has the right to the rise in the value of your services. It has, indeed, complete ownership rights to you and me, as well as to our property. That's, a, as I say, a thoroughly subversive doctrine. And yet, there is no doubt that it is the direction in which philosophical attitudes have been moving. So our present energy problem, like our present problem in many other areas, derived from the cumulative effects of the cartel, of government controls and regulations, and of this change in philosophical attitudes. What is the present status and prospects, then, for U.S. regulation? Many people have emphasized that Carter's energy plan would not achieve its stated objectives. But that's looking at the surface of things. The true and real objectives of the energy plan are not and cannot be the stated objectives. Again, I have a very difficult choice to make. James Schlesinger is an intelligent, well-trained economist. He cannot possibly believe that the plan he has pr proposed would produce the results he says it would. What is, it, what is the real objective? As of so many other things, you have to look beneath the surface. The real objective is power and control. You have, many wide you have many predictions that Mr. Carter will not get his way, that there will come out of Congress an energy plan that will be very different than what he puts in. I think that's wrong. I think Mr. Carter has already gotten his way in what really counts. He has already gotten the major element of the whole program, namely a Department of Energy. A Department of Energy which has 20,000 employees and a budget of $10 billion. A budget roughly equivalent to the profits of all of the American oil <laughs> companies combined. He is going to spend, what is it, $3 a barrel of oil in order to keep the price of oil from rising. But more important, you therefore have 20,000 full-time employees who have a strong interest to propagandize for and to work for 
the government takeover of the oil industry. And is there any doubt that that is what they will be doing? Let every other element of that program be defeated in Congress, be turned down. And it's only a question of time until they're enacted. Because what really matters is having the position of power from which to move. So I believe that those people who have been rather optimistic on the ground that Congress is not going to enact the measures Carter proposed are making an enormous mistake that the Congress has already given Carter what he, most of what's involved. And I may say the Department of Energy was established with a bipartisan vote of Republicans and Democrats. Unfortunately, Republican politicians are no less short-sighted than Democratic politicians when it comes to matters of this kind. The question, next question and the final question is how come Why is it that we have moved in this direction? Why is it that we have adopted these counterproductive controls on the prices of gas and oil, that we have enacted this enormously expensive boondoggle of a Department of Energy? The answer is very straightforward. The enactment of such intervention has been and remains politically profitable. We must apply the same kind of an analysis to the political system that we apply to the economic system. If we try to interpret the way business acts, we ask what is, what is, it, what is in it for business? What direction of activity is profitable? We have to ask the same thing on the political level. That's a different market in which the people are trying uh, to acquire votes, they're trying to acquire position and influence, and they will do what's politically profitable to do. They have gotten political hay from professing to protect the consumers of natural gas from higher heating bills. Here is the senator from my, my longtime state of residence, Illinois, Senator Adlai Stevenson, who has been in the forefront of those trying to hold, to hold down natural gas. I once wrote an article in which I said that was a bill he was proposing was a bill to drive industry out of the state of Illinois. That's indeed what it is. Because if you hold down natural gas prices, it's going to be first allocated to residences. Industry isn't going to get it. They're going to move down to Texas to be able to get it intrastate. But nonetheless, the lower price of oil was visible to Mr. Stevenson's constituents, the lower price of gas. The fact that they were losing their jobs in the process, that wasn't visible. So he gained votes the one way and didn't lose them the other. There is too much of a tendency to interpret votes in terms of what people believe. Human beings are amazingly adaptable. The capacity of the human being to adjust his beliefs to his interests cannot be underestimated. Again, consider the present energy bill. It's been an enormous source of political hay and contributions from both sides. Those who are opposing it contribute. Those who are in favor of it contribute. And so it's in the self-interest of Congress to argue about and debate and discuss issues of this kind in order to have something to sell to their constituents. Over and above this, you have had the general sentiment in society at large toward more and more government control. And this is only a particular manifestation of it. After all, this isn't the first industry that's being nationalized. Passenger traffic has been nationalized through Amtrak. Freight traffic is on the way to being nationalized through Conrail. It's a continuation of that same trend that the energy industry is on the way to being nationalized. What is the bottom line? What will be the effect on the price and the availability of energy? Well, obviously, the situation is not a very favorable one. But I think it's a mistake to go to the other extreme and become a purveyor of doom and gloom. 
You should ne just as you should never underestimate the ability of people to adjust their beliefs to their interests, you should also never underestimate the ability of people to get around controls that interfere with them. There is a strong incentive for people all around the world to find ways of getting around these artificially expensive energy, to find ways to produce and benefit from the artificial energy. And as a result, the price of crude oil will come down in real terms, as it has been coming down since 1973. Sooner or later, the cartel will break down. Now, let me emphasize again, that doesn't mean it was a mistake for the people to, from their point of view to have had the cartel. You must not confuse two different propositions. The statement that the cartel will ultimately break down and disappear is one statement. The implication that people sometimes draw from that, that it was against their interest to establish the cartel, is wholly wrong. During this temporary period of running the cartel, they are amassing enormous wealth. That wealth is not going to disappear when the cartel breaks down. All that means is that when the cartel breaks down, their regular business of providing oil will go back to yielding them the kind of income it did before. But in addition, they will have this enormous accumulated wealth. Of course, like all governments, they will be short-sighted too, and they will dissipate much of it. So it may be they won't end up much better than they would have been, but they will have quite a fling in the interval. <laughs> so that I think that we're not going to head for doom and gloom. The price of energy will come down. We are not going to have a worldwide shortage of energy. But we're going to pay a heavy price. We shall have a lower standard of living than we could have had. We shall have a lower rate of growth than we could have had. And we shall end up stuck with another major government parasite sucking our lifeblood and making it more difficult to overcome the adverse effects of government controls on our lives. Thank you.